Welcome and thank you for joining this online community of spiritual seekers. You have a place here. Whether you are old or young or in between, whether you're worked off your feet or you're bored out of your mind, whether you're deeply lonely or you are desperate for time to yourself, whether you're making the most of these strange pandemic times or you're clinging to sanity just trying to get through another day. You have a place at this table and you're not just invited, you are included. Your presence matters. You're not just welcome, you have a place of belonging at this table. As we share and celebrate its diversity of age, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, race, religion, as we share the diversity of moods we bring and fears we carry and hopes we dare and longings we bring, and together we continue to explore our new theme, dinner table wisdom. Joining me in welcoming you here today at this table is my teammate Chris, Pam on the piano, Deb and Pam leading us in song, Dara and Noah helping us with all things technical, and Dawn standing in for all of you. I invite you to take a moment to acknowledge where your table rests. The long story of the formation of land you call home and the long story of those who first made that land home. Let's take a moment to honor the soil, air, water, and fire, the native creatures and plants, to honor the indigenous peoples who first found ways to live in relationship with the land we call home. Here where this table is set, we stand in Treaty 6 territory, traditional lands of Cree and Métis peoples. And as we set our table, we do so with a commitment to live in ways that seek to heal the wounds of colonization and learn from one another a new, respectful, equitable, healing way forward into the future. Over this past year, our webcams and cameras have taken us into each other's homes. And thanks to video conferencing, we've gotten very familiar with one another's spaces. Over the coming weeks, we invite you to share images of your table with us. It might be when it is set or empty or filled with food. Today, we're grateful for Andrea Rubik sharing her table with us. We take our place with one another, claiming our seat at the table, seeking wisdom in the words that we will say and think and sing, in the thoughts and insights we'll share and those that will come to each of us, in the memories we will hold, in the intentions we'll nourish. We take this moment as we do each time we gather, to light a candle, to set apart this time and space wherever you are, I invite you to light your candle with us. There are many flames, some flickering, others blaring a common fire we share, a common passion we hold together for a world where everyone born has a safe place at our table, fully belonging, whole and free. We sing as an expression 
of our commitment to do whatever we can to make it so. Our time for all ages today is a story, perhaps a silly story, but a story that goes deeper than we might first think. It's a story by C.C. C. Ming and it's called World Pizza. It's illustrated by Ellen Shi.
The tall hill with the cherry trees and the soft grass was the best place to look for a wishing star. Mama found one. It wasn't the brightest nor the biggest in the sky that night, but it was still a great wishing star. So Mama made her wish. I wish for world peace. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, chew! A floating cherry blossom had tickled her nose into a giant sneeze. Mama wished for world pizza, said Jack. I think she meant world peace, said Papa. I definitely he heard world pizza, said Joe. Just then, a pizza fell from the sky, landing like a warm blanket on Mama's lap. The kids didn't know about peace, but they certainly knew about pizza. And this particular pizza was delicious. Mama, in her heart, still wished for peace, for a world filled with kindness and love and no fighting. But she agreed the pizza was delicious. So they ate until their bellies were full. Everyone was happy. Across the world in another town on another hill sat another family and another pizza carried on the wind appeared. This one landed atop the father's head. That family agreed the pizza was delicious, so they ate until their bellies were full and everyone was happy. Pizza started appearing in valleys, in deserts, and on the very topmost points of snowy, blowy mountains. People living in the biggest building of the biggest town got pizza. People living in the smallest building of the smallest town got pizza. People with no place to live at all got pizza. In fact, those people got extra. There was spicy pepper pizza, salty seaweed pizza, chocolate cherry pizza, and extra cheesy with pickles pizza. None of the pizzas were the same. But they were all delicious. Some people dipped their pizza in hummus, while others dipped their pizza in guacamole. Some people made pizza chow mein, and some people made pizza sushi. Some even made pizza soup. They all agreed the different pizzas were delicious, so they shared. And everyone was happy. The pirates on the rough ocean seas put down their swords to eat their pizza. They agreed the pizza was superb. Once they stopped fighting, they realized they were tired of being angry and tired of hurting each other, so they kicked their swords to the bottom of the sea. And all the pirates were happy. Even angry neighbors with tall fences and locked doors got pizza. They peeked over their fences and frowned at the pizzas that looked nothing like their own. They shook their fists and called out, go away! Until the scrumptious smell made them stop. And they looked at the faces of the different people eating every kind of pizza imaginable. They saw the smiles and they couldn't help but smile back. So they opened their doors wide and joined the fun outside. There were pizza tossing contests, there were pizza parties, there was even a pizza parade. People all over the world talked and laughed and ate until their bellies were full. Even after the pizza was gone, the people stayed, they made friends. And in that moment, the world was filled with kindness and love and no fighting. On top of the tall hill with the cherry trees, Mama picked up the last piece of pizza, gave it to the stray dog that followed them home. And as Mama tucked Jack, Joe, and baby Mo into bed, Jack yawned and said, Mama, I'm sorry you didn't get your wish for world peace. Mama gave them each a kiss and turned out the light. Next time, she whispered. The family fell asleep cozy in the warmth of their peaceful dreams. And everyone was happy. Gotcha.
Hi everyone, thank you for tuning back into our Social Isolation Song Series number nine. We went back to the book today. We have a sacred folk song from the African American tradition called The Welcome Table. I love this song. The original lyrics say, I'm gonna sit at the welcome table, but our dear friend Akaya Winwood, she sings a beautiful arrangement of this song saying, we're gonna sit at the welcome table. And that's exactly what we're gonna do because the only way we're gonna get through this is together. So please join us on this tune. We're gonna sit at the welcome table. We're gonna sit at the welcome table one of these days. We're gonna sit at the welcome table. We're gonna sit. I think that if I'm honest, I can honestly say that as a young person, I was never really part of any clubs. I don't know what it was. Joining groups was not really my thing. I guess I always was more interested in solo kind of activities. But maybe also being part of a club should make us nervous, not just because we're shy or an introvert or whatever word I would describe myself as a child, but maybe clubs should make us nervous in general. Isn't it interesting that we use the same word to describe a weapon that we use to define those organizations that meet with similar-minded and interested people? Often behind closed doors, doors with signs that say, members only, a club is lethal when it's used as a weapon to keep someone out. Maybe the whole history of the world can be told in the tragic conflicts of class, caste, 
race, religion, gender, apartheid, genocide. Yet still, exclusive is one of those most seductive words to us. We want to be part of a select group that gets, oh, I don't know, early sales, quick access, shorter lines, special deals. It's seductive and it's one of the most dangerous words that we can yield. Dwight Curry is an American author. He writes this, Why does belonging have to mean exclusion? Why must someone be kept out in order for the rest of us to want in? And for that matter, is inclusion any better? If to exclude someone is to shut them out, then to include is to shut them in. Membership in the wrong club might be worse than no membership at all. Either way, when you're a club card carrying member, your world grows smaller and your options grow fewer. That was Dwight Curry. There's a story about a dinner that Jesus attended and it goes something like this. Jesus went to see a man named Levi at his work collecting taxes. And Jesus said to him, come along with me. And he did. Walked away from everything and followed him. So then Levi gave a large dinner at his home for Jesus. Everybody was there. He invited his friends, other tax collectors, and there were other dis disreputable characters as guests at the dinner. The Pharisees and their religion scholars came to Jesus' disciples, greatly offended. What is he doing, eating and drinking with misfits and sinners? Jesus heard about it and spoke up. He called out, who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? Who needs a meal, the well-fed or the hungry? I'm here inviting outsiders, not insiders. An invitation to a changed life, changed inside and out. As far as I can tell, at this dinner at Levi's house, worlds were colliding. There were the usual raucous crowd that Levi was used to, that he would always invite to his parties, I would assume, his fellow tax guys, or as the community might have called them, the traitors to the empire. There were all sorts. And then, on the other side of the room, the religious crowd, the white-collar types, you know, the scholars, the purveyors of what was supposedly good and upright and decent or so they define it. Two worlds at the same party. And much like my family, um, I'm sorry, much like those who were present that were just not used to such a varied guest list, they were compelled to ask, what is he doing? Why are all these people here? Why are this type of people here? A small detour, I, I was listening this week to a weekly CBC podcast called Party Lines where they were discussing pandemic anger. Uh, that's a new term, believe it or not. Um, that's a real thing. And as they were talking about it, um, it, it became clear that if this pandemic were a dinner party, uh, we likewise would have worlds colliding at the party. We have all those who are doing their best to follow health guidelines, to heed the restrictions, to minimize their contact with others. Researchers tell us that the vast majority of Canadians are willing to do this. Not necessarily happy, 13 months in, but are willing to comply. And in the same space, we have those who are fed up, 
those who are angry with those same restrictions, who are not just angry but are compelled to act and speak up, to express their anger, to protest restrictions. Tim Caulfield, researcher in health health law and policy, was quoted in the National Post this week saying, Our leaders just asking people to follow the restrictions over and over again isn't enough. We have to engage people and listen to them. And that's what our leaders need to be doing. So what if those of us who are quietly doing our part move away from shaming those who don't see it the same way as us? What if we acknowledge to ourselves and to each other that, yes, this is hard. This is difficult. It's been a long year as we acknowledge the fatigue, the anger at all the time and all the opportunities lost It's easy to dismiss the protesters. It's easy to tisk and write off those who are pushing back. The hard thing to do is sit with that anger and acknowledge that it's valid. Anger and fear are emotions that are valid. We all choose different ways to deal with it and to act upon it. But sitting with those emotions of anger and fear open us up a crack to accept that there are other people at this party. People are feeling it just as much or more than we are. There are always other people at the party and we're not, and we're not always familiar with them. And we don't always agree with them. And we don't understand them yet. Now, Jesus takes this to the next level. His response to the righteous complainers about these other kind of people at the party is to call them and us out. To say, hey, look, this party's for everyone. Or maybe even more accurately, hey, this party's not for you, you fat cats. This party's for them. Who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? Who needs a meal, the well-fed or the hungry? Here I am, he says, inviting outsiders, not insiders. An invitation to a changed life inside and out. That one speaks right to me. I wonder if it speaks to you too. Because I'm the insider. I'm the one with a meal to share. I'm the one with the roof over my head, not worrying about whether there might not be enough food each night for my family. I'm the one with a vehicle to drive wherever I want. I'm the one with the luxury of working from home in what could be dangerous community viral spread. I'm the one passing by that woman with the sign near near our grocery store that says she's hungry. There's an invitation to us whenever we formulate the guest list, the guest list of our lives. An invitation for guest and host alike to not just change our clothes for dinner, but to change our hearts, to change our minds, to change our attitudes. Because it's not an easy thing to make room. There's a lot of shifting that has to happen to dinnerware, to chairs around, but also to our lives. And in case we're thinking that it's an easy answer, I think the point Jesus is making that it is that it's not about charity. It's not about the haves giving something to the have-nots. It's about the fact that when the outsiders are invited, the change happens to the inviters just as much or more than the invitees. I think that's why he says, 
This is an invitation to a changed life, changed inside and out. It seems like a naive wish to imagine that one could hope for world peace or world pizza, as the case may be, and to revel in the fanciful dream that pizza could just fall from the sky. But this isn't kid stuff, this book, this story. This is faithful to the long tradition of prophecy and wisdom. This is the real deal. Just as when people would hear there will be a time when the wolf lies down The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. This is the same kind of stuff as hungry and wandering people one day entering a land flowing with milk and honey. This is the same kind of stuff as the struggle to realize the dream that children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. A children's book? Maybe, but as it turns out, that innocuous little story about pizza is planted firmly in the tradition of inspiring us toward a better day, a better life, a better humanity in line with the great prophets of our time and all time. The fact is, we are able to work toward world peace, a world of peace, a lot more effectively if our bellies are full. The fact is, we are much better able to make friends over fences if we share equitably in the fence and the land upon which it sits. The fact is, we can more easily share the happiness of shared dreams for our children when, the tr- when we know that there's more than enough in the world and we live it out in the sharing of the earth's bounty. The fact is, we are more able to work toward racial justice when black men aren't being shot. So, we all deserve to be seen as human beings, not as objects, not as stereotypes. We all need love. We all want health and goodness and wholeness for ourselves and those in our lives. And we are each of us, enough. We all deserve respect. Everyone we encounter deserves it. We are all invited. It's our fault if we can't deal with that. And we make up some petty reasons why it's not fair. It's our failure if we look down our noses and and sneer at the quote-unquote thems. We've all got a place at the welcome table, and it's our job to set the place cards. We may not be inviting many people over for dinner at the moment. We just can't. But we are encountering people in need who need their humanity honored. We are noticing the inequities of our responses to this pandemic, aren't we? Its effects on women, on caregivers, on low-wage workers, on all those already challenged and for whom this year has only made the gap widen. So we may not be making up guest lists for a literal table, but we know who needs to be on them, don't we? What will we do in place of a dinner party? That's our question. That's our challenge. What will the invitation look like? Where will, our, where will our love abound for this world? What will world pizza look like to you this week? In all things, we measure our guest lists, our words, our actions, our whole lives on our love. This year marks the 21st, 25th anniversary of Rent on Broadway. So here's the original cast with a reminder that it's always the season for love. 
Let's invite that love into our lives every day as we make out our guest lists, as we ensure that those who need to be included are included, as we set a large and endless table. We spend a few moments honoring the life of Eleanor Aiken. Many of us know Eleanor in the last few years as being the quintessential grandmother, Grammy as she was known to Arwen, Eliana, and Cassidy. Sundays were family time for Rebecca and her mom Eleanor to spend the day with uh, Rebecca and Aaron and the kids, and we were fortunate to get to know her over the last five or six years or so. Eleanor was born in England, and after a few early years in Ireland, her family moved to Canada and settled in Quebec when Eleanor was five. Inspired by her father's experience with the Red Cross in World War II, Eleanor was passionate about becoming a nurse. She graduated in 1965 And in her almost 50-year career as a nurse, she worked as a clinical instructor, clinical supervisor, and team leader in Quebec, Florida, and here at the Misericordia in Edmonton. She often spoke of her deep gratitude for having the opportunity to be a nurse. 
After retiring in 2011, Eleanor moved in with her daughter Rebecca and family, and she spent time volunteering in the grade one classroom, and of course relishing all the time she got to spend with her grandchildren. Her family, her siblings honor the way that she lived with humor, with resilience and strength, with a love for animals and with care for others, always at the forefront. Her loving presence as a grandma to many in our baby room and our preschool room will be missed. Her soft-hearted smile and her gentle nature will be missed by all of us. So we honor Eleanor's life. We celebrate her place in the lives of those her, who loved her. Our hearts are with her family, with Aaron, Rebecca, and the kids. We know the loss that you feel and the hole that she will leave. And we know that she is also because of the love she shared and the love she received, she is safe in the undying light of love, now and always, as we sing in honor of the life of Eleanor Aiken. In gratitude for the gift of life and the opportunity that is ours each time we pause like this to recalibrate, reorient, reset our intention, pray with one another. And so we do just that together, offering the words you find before you. We embrace the sacredness of all life as we work toward the vision of the world as it could be. We seek an awareness and a gratitude in each moment, ensuring that our neighbor has enough for today. We pray that we might let go of all that clings as guilt and embrace relationships of trust. May we offer and receive forgiveness as a way to freedom we commit to living examined lives, 
inspired to find meaning in our living, and working to transform every challenge into an opportunity to grow and thrive and give. As we walk in the light of deep gratitude, may it ever be so. Each time we change our light, we witness an act of transformation. As flame takes on a new form and becomes smoke, may it be for us a symbol. In this change of light, may it also be a symbol of our change of perspective our change of heart, our change of mind, to live at the table of life, the table of screens and streets and checkout counters in ways that bring an invitation to those we pass in the street to those with whom we interact in safe and essential ways. May we offer an invitation of hospitality, of compassion, of patience, of understanding. And may we be changed by those with whom we share the freeway, the sidewalk, the path, the neighborhood, the conversation in safe, distanced ways or on the screen. May we be changed by those we dare to know, those we have not yet really met. Let us go into this time to be light, to be love. May we go safely and may we go well.